Good evening, everybody. How are you? Gosh, I love worshiping with these guys. I know I say it each week, but I really mean it. I love, I love the harmonizing that they do. Good job, guys. Thanks, Rick. Well, Merry Christmas. Thanks. I received that. Well, we have been going through the book of John on Sunday nights. Next week, we're going to take a quick break from the book of John, and we'll talk about a Christmas message, and we'll go through Matthew 1 next week, okay? Tonight, we are in the book of John, and we are in chapter 17, and we're in verse 6. I'll read it aloud, and we'll also have the scripture available for you guys. Okay, John chapter 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of Christmas, the gift of salvation brought through this baby boy, your son, Lord. Lord, we want more grace. Holy Spirit, we want to draw closer to you. So please help these verses come alive to us. Help them uh, draw us closer to you and, and just mature us, Lord, in Jesus' name. We all agreed by saying amen. Okay, so the last few chapters of John, what we've been talking about is we saw... Uh, the last dinner that Jesus ever had, the Last Supper. And he laid on them some great, amazing, uh, some, a new perspective of how to serve one another. He, he washes their feet. The creator of the universe washes their feet. He tells them of, of a betrayer among them. He tells Peter, who's been with him for the last few years, you're, you're going to deny me. And he, they get up from the table and they start taking a walk and they're walking toward Gethsemane. He walks by the temple. He points out that, guys, look at the, the grapevines and the branches. Abide in me and thrive, meaning produce much fruit like, like the vines and the branches, okay? And as he's walking, he stops and he, and he looks up and he prays. And so we're seeing here in chapter 17 this special conversation between God the Son and God the Father. And the disciples, the 11 of them, they're sitting there listening as Jesus is praying to his, his, his Father. And we've learned, last week what we learned was God is not so much con concerned with the posture of our hearts rather than rather the position of our bodies, right? I've, I've, we pointed that out as, as Jesus stops and he looks up to heaven rather than, okay, everybody, bow your heads and close your eyes and assume the position and let's, let's pray together. No, Jesus just talked to his heavenly father. Well, tonight, 
what we're going to learn is we're going to learn that even though Jesus is about to be arrested and crucified, he has someone, some people, and something on his heart. And with that, I want to dig right into verse 1. Let's see who and what is on Jesus' heart. So verse, uh, verse not 1, verse 6. We're starting at verse 6 in John 17. I have manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Okay? So last week, Jesus was praying for himself, and this week, Jesus is praying for his disciples. They're following him. His students, those people that pledged their lives to follow Jesus and his teaching, to see what his, he was all about. His students. I've manifested your name. Okay, in the Bible, when we, when we learn about names, names refer to the nature of something or someone or their character, okay? There's something in names. For example, Jacob. He was a schemer. You know, Jacob was a schemer. His name comes from the Hebrew root. That means to take by the heel, to trip up or to deceive. Jacob's name. Uh, Isaac means laughter. Even the name of Jesus reveals that he's the Savior. The name Jesus itself, it really is a contraction, a couple words being put together. His Hebrew name, Yehovah Shua, shortened to be Yeshua, which is Yehovah, is salvation. Jesus says in his prayer, I have manifested your name. I've revealed to these guys your nature, your personality, Lord. I've revealed your personality. Those who know your name, they trust in you when we get to... Okay, that's a psalm, okay? From Psalm chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Those who know your name, they trust in you, okay? Last week, in Jesus' prayer, he talked about eternal life is knowing God. Gnosko, experiencing, perceiving with understanding, growing with him through experiences, getting close to God. You know, one thing I want to make mention, brethren, is that what we're learning in weeks, this is happening in minutes. Probably took him a minute or two to say this prayer, and we're taking three weeks because it's so rich, full of, ener uh, full of information. From the Last Supper to, get to Gethsemane, it might have taken minutes to walk it, and we've taken like a couple of months, and you're probably thinking, well, Pastor Rick, that's because you're pretty long-winded up there. No. It's because there's so much to take from these rich scriptures, okay? So just keep that in mind. I mean, we were just talking sentences uh, last week, and so just a few seconds have, have transpired. So I'm, I'm cutting back and forth so we can build context and background so we're all on the same page here. Okay, and so I say that, and, and I read verse, uh, Psalm chapter 9, verse 10, where it says, those who trust in your name know you, if you'll recall from last week, trust requires three ingredients. Trust takes time, right? Over time, we get to know God. The next ingredient, it's variety of situations and circumstances. Okay, the next ingredient is consistent responses. So we get to trust God over time right, as we walk through a bunch of different situations with him and see and live through his consistent responses. So that's how we get to know and trust the Lord. Okay, Jesus didn't simply teach about the name or the character of God. He manifested it. He displayed God's character. All those miracles, all those reaching out and grabbing hold of the outcasts and healing them and loving them and forgiving them, all of his time spent teaching, he's just displaying God through his actions. And they saw this, these disciples, they're hearing him pray this, and they, I'm sure they're recalling things that they had seen and experienced over the last three years they spent with him. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, he says in verse 7. And we saw this in chapter 16. They said, now we know you're from God. We know now they're getting it, you know. The, the disciples don't have it all figured out now. It's kind of comforting for us is because I, I don't have it all figured out. I spend time studying this, but believe me, I do not have it all figured out. 
And these disciples, they're, they're getting close to knowing and understanding, but man, until they saw that tomb empty, and they're like, what happened? And then they see him, and one of them touches him, and oh my gosh, then they start having breakfast with him. Then, man, at one point, Jesus, he just explains and unfolds scripture for them, and it starts making sense to them. But they know, they get quite a bit of this spiritual truth that he's been laying down for them. We know that we know, man, knowing God loves you, knowing that you're here on purpose, that is a big thing. There's no accident. We're here on purpose. God planned for you and I. He formed you and I. He thought about you and I when we were in, in our mother's womb. He loves us. And knowing that, oh my gosh, knowing what you know about the Lord, that he's there, that he's present, that he loves you, man, that's, that's half the battle. That's what our writer wants us to know. He wants us to believe and know that we have eternal life with the Lord. In 1 John, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, John writes this, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. <clears throat> in verse 8, he says, For I have given to them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them and have known surely that I come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me the words which you gave me. Remember, he said this several times now. He's on mission, sent from God the Father. Everything he's saying is from God the Father. He's done what God the Father has told him. <clears throat> he, he says it in John chapter 12. I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command. What should I say? And what should I say and what I should speak? They too, the disciples, received the words, the message he was sharing. I'm from you and they believed it they we had a choice they could have rejected what he said they had a choice in the matter they had a choice to accept this message or reject it the message simply put for god so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes will not perish but have life that lasts forever his son didn't come into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16 and 17. The focus of Jesus' prayer right here. He says, I pray for them in verse 9. I pray for them. He's talking about these guys right in front of him. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have sent, who have you have given me, for they are yours. So, it's not that Jesus is neglecting us as 21st century believers, but again, context, background, what's really going on in our, in our passage tonight. He's talking about the people right in front of him, his disciples, his students. Last week, we learned about a gift that God gave his son. During Christmas time, we always think of the gift, the reason for the season. Jesus is, he's the gift to us, right? We, you, are a gift. Humanity, we're the gift. God has given his son. How cool is that? And like I said last week, he didn't even keep the gift receipt. He didn't go to Kohl's and return you to Amazon. No, he wants us. He keeps us. He loves us. <clears throat> so at this point, Jesus is talking about the disciples right in front of him. But rest assured, Rest assured, be confident, be secure. Know that you know that you, we, are God's gift to Jesus. Verse 10, and all mine are yours, yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. All mine are yours. We share everything. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, they share everything. Perfect fellowship, harmony. 
I love this, the, this, this other part of this verse. John documents something. He says that Jesus was praying, and he's saying that he was glorified in them, these disciples. Think about the disciples. Peter's getting ready to deny him, right? As soon as the chicken shows up, he's going to deny him. Okay. Uh, James and John, I can't remember if Greg got to this part or not in his message today, but they got reje rejected, right? And they wanted to burn the village down that rejected Jesus and them. I'm trying to say the disciples, the students, they had their hang-ups. They had their shortcomings. In spite of all of that, Jesus says, I stand glorified in them. Pastors often like to poke fun of themselves and they say, God can use anybody. He can even use a donkey to share his word. I'm telling you, he can use anybody. He stands glorified in them, in spite of all of their shortcomings and failings. It's what he does. He uses imperfect people to achieve awesome things. He uses everything, right? He causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28, all things. He uses sinners saved by grace to share his message of love and hope. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these things, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I'm going back to you keep them, guard them. These disciples you've given me, man, they need all the help they can get, Lord. Help these guys. I give them back to you, Lord. When I read this, it makes me think of, uh, my kids are little, but I have friends more mature in age than I, and they've had children grow up and go off to college and go start their own lives, and They've reminded me, they've told me that over the years, one of the harder lessons for them to learn as parents was like, they're God's kids, and at some point they have to trust God with them and just allow them to launch and just pray that God keeps them and guards them. I, uh, I don't look forward to that day, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah, we'll just wait. We'll just wait the 10 years that's ahead of us. <laughs> Patiently, very patiently. Jesus knew that these disciples needed prayer because he wouldn't be there in his bodily presence to help them because his trial, his, uh, that punishment, and the cross are just hours away from Jesus in his lifetime right now at this moment as he's praying. Have you figured out who's on his heart? His followers, humanity, were on his heart. <clears throat> he says in this verse that they may be as one as we are. Important concept here. He's talking about the Trinity, the perfect fellowship, that perfect communion between them. They're in perfect relationship, perfect harmony, unity and harmony. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're not arguing with each other. They have perfect fellowship with each other. He wants this for the disciples and his followers. And they're all different, right? But they have the same goal of this message of hope. Kind of like a football team, right? You know, when a football team is unified, it doesn't mean that, that everyone's playing the same position, but it does mean that they're all trying to get to the same goal line, right? If an orchestra is harmonious, it doesn't mean that they're, they're all playing the same instrument, right? No, they're just playing the same song. I love, uh, I was thinking about this illustration as I was listening to Neil and Gentry and Robert up here. They harmonize really well when a choir is in great harmony, it's not, it's not because they're all singing the same part. No, 
It's because they're all adding their part to the same song. It's the goal that produces the unity. Unity is not sameness. Unity has to do with the same purpose. God's using all of our different personalities and attitude and strengths, right, to achieve his purpose. He's the goal. Jesus, his love in getting, making disciples of all nations. The goal is Jesus and getting his message out there. And, and he's using all these parts to get that goal done. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you have gave me, I have kept, and none of them might be lost, none of them lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. <clears throat> his, though his struggles, right, are at an end, well, they're coming to an end as he endures the cross, the disciples are not. They're sticking around. Well, who's he talking about here, the son of perdition? Judas. Well, you lost him, Jesus? Is that what's happening? Well, well, is Judas ever his, I ask? Judas is not an example of a believer who lost his salvation. He's an example of an unbeliever who pretended to have salvation and got finally exposed. I, I though, do, I believe, though, that he did fulfill scripture, but I believe he had a choice the whole time. He could have chosen to receive, and he could have chosen to just believe. He could have chosen to repent, if that were the case, if he chose to, but he didn't, and he fulfilled scripture. <clears throat> he had a choice uh, the whole time. Verse 13, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Well, Jesus had been in the world, and now his disciples are going to remain in the world. They were learning about the Father, so they could be handling, handle being in the world, shall I say, handle being in the world, and still enjoy the full measure of joy within them. At this point, I think the disciples may have recalled what, what he said in John 15. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. And we talked about joy at length um, last week or the week before. Joy doesn't just come and go with circumstances. Joy doesn't just come and go as the culture changes around us. As our situations change from like, wow, this amazing thing just happened to me, to I cannot believe this might be the worst season of my life. Joy is what carries us through the difficulties that we're in. I know that I'm going to be with Jesus forever. Joy. This side of heaven is temporary. I'm going to be in heaven forever with Jesus doesn't just come and go as situations come and go and change. Joy of Jesus takes us through all these circumstances. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. It's way more than like a cool sticker on the back of cars, okay? This not of the world thing. I've given them your word, he tells, he tells the Lord. God's word with us from the Holy Spirit. We have it. <laughs> we have it right here, God's inspired word. It's with us. We have his message, and it gives us joy. It gives us strength. Why does the world hate us? Well, it hates us because we don't belong to its system. We're, Jesus, he is countercultural. <laughs> to his world. They hated him for it. They didn't like that he was shaking all, all these things up, that he was reaching out and loving the unlovable, forgiving people. Well, how could he forgive them? Only God can forgive people. Hello? <laughs> He's God the Son right in front of you. He was doing all these amazing things, and it was just roughing up the popular religious system of, of the day. Believer, we're not of this world, but we do live in it. 
and we can enjoy it. We can, we can have joy. We can have joy in resting in God's love. We have his message that teaches us to. We have his spirit that's just calling us and reminding us to. We can rest in God's love and we can make it through any circumstance. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Okay, that, that verse is worth reading again so you can catch what he just said. Okay, one more time. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Okay, told you about the disciples a little bit. Peter was great at interjecting at certain times. Right now would have been a good time. I could totally picture Peter going, whoa, 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 Lord. Did you just say the, Lord, the world hates us? It's going to get crazy for us? Don't take us out of here? What's that all about? Nope. He remains silent for once in his life. Come on, Peter. He said, don't take them out of the world. Protect them. Yeah, man, he's praying that we should endure what's going on around us, we, that we should have God's strength. Man, Jesus is the man. He has a lot of faith in us. He's asking God, just keep him here. We, I know it's crazy, but I know it's going to get crazy for these guys, but, but protect them from the evil one. Years ago, I, uh, I'm, I'm also the children's pastor here at the church, and I do the Hallelujah Party. I oversee the Hallelujah Party. And one year, we were building these Hallelujah Party carnival booths like we do every year for the kids. And when we build them, we wrap them in plastic, and we put netting up, and we get these things ready for the kids to just have fun. We decorate them days later. Well, we're getting ready to work, me and a bunch of guys, and, and we're out there, and I see the clouds coming, the breeze is picking up. And man, I thought it was totally going to rain and get cold, and I'm like, oh. So we all pray. Okay, we're all praying. So I, here's this believer in the Lord, more mature than I am in age, in age. And he starts praying. He's like, Lord, if it's going to rain and be all windy and cold, give us the strength to get through it. And all the men were like, amen, amen. And to myself, I go, Lord, I'm the pastor here. I pray that it's not rainy or cold. And then the breeze started to pick up again. I was such a wimp. My gosh, that's not what God's calling us to do. He's like, Lord, I pray that you keep them here and that you protect them and guard them. Of course, we want to be rescued from the storms, the challenges, the disappointments. Let's stop using cliches. We want to get, we want to get rescued from the addictions and the depression, the chaos and the anxiety and the evil and the wicked and the gang violence that's out there. I want to get rescued from all that. God says, no, I want you to, I want to pray and protect you from the evil one. I have friends as they're counseling phone, people on the phone thinking about hurting themselves. Hey, the Lord says we're going to, he's praying that we stick this out. He's praying for us. Jesus himself is praying for us. Don't hurt yourself, if that's what you're thinking. Don't hurt yourself. Jesus is praying for you. God the Son is praying for not just these guys, for us too. He prays for us. He's our intermediary. There's no, no other way to God than except through his Son. He's, he's in our corner, is what this tells me. And, and, and he, has more faith, he has more faith than I than I do sometimes. You know what's cool is you could probably take that to the bank. Here's why. Because he knit you together in your mother's womb. There's no accidents. You weren't here on accident. I don't even know why I'm here. My life's not worth it. It's worth it. You want to know how worth it? Look at the cross. That's how valuable we are. God's son given to us, his only son. Man. And he's praying to his dad, protect them. I know for a fact that my earthly dad, who, man, when I was a kid, this guy was tough as nails. If one of my friends was hurting or something like that, and I would have said, Dad, I need, we need your help. He would have busted down someone's door and protected that kid with his life. And he's some earthly dude that's fallible. God the Father, he's perfect. He's the good, good father who's perfect in all of his ways. 
And we are loved by him. That's who we are. I love that song. He's saying, man, God the Son is saying, Lord, keep them here and protect them from the evil one because there is an evil one. Okay? And when all this stuff is happening, gosh, to, to us believers, the chaos, the horror, the, the scary stuff when it's happening, gosh, it seems like when the pressure is applied, that's when the good stuff comes out anyways. Right? I couldn't find a new toothpaste bottle in my house. We, we have toothpaste, okay? But I was trying to find a new one so I could say, what happens? How do we get the good stuff out? You squeeze it, right? A diamond, right? How do, you, how do you get a diamond? You apply heat and pressure, right? That's what happens. The heat and the pressure comes, and then the good stuff comes out. It's kind of what happens to our lives. We're in the frying pan for a little while, right? Use a, use a meat metaphor for the guys out here. How, do you, how, how does the carne asada come out well? You apply heat to it, just the right temp, and then all of a sudden it starts becoming flavorful, right? That aroma is attractive when the heat's turned up. Believer, you know what? They really don't talk about how hard it is before becoming a believer. It's like once you're in, that's when the target comes on your back. We don't tell that to like new believers sometimes. And then you see them get all scared, like, what did I sign up for? But man, Jesus is praying that God protects us. Amen? All right. Let's see. Jesus didn't pray that we would be taken out of the battle right, but that we'd be strengthened. Here's some verses, like, if you're going through it. Okay? I love Ephesians 6. I want to leave you with this before we get to our next point. Protected from the evil one, from his schemes and strategies. Ephesians 6 Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, it talks about the armor of God. And twice he says, put on the whole armor of God. Let me give you a spoiler. Every piece of the armor is Jesus, the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is righteous, right? Uh, belt of truth, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Helmet of salvation, who's our salvation? Jesus. The whole thing is Jesus, okay? And as I, as I was saying, each piece symbolizes Jesus, but he tells us what to do with it. Stand firm. That's what we're supposed to do. Stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Satan is an all power. He's not all powerful. And he's not everywhere at the same time. That's called omnipresent, if you're one of our theologians in the group. He's not all powerful. He's not everywhere all at the same time. And he's not all knowing. Okay, he's not any of those. God is every one of those. But you know what Satan is? He's a good strategist. He's strategic. Though it's the wiles of the devil. But we're supposed to put on the armor of God, which is Jesus, and we're supposed to stand firm. If you're struggling, Jesus knows it. If you're crying out to him, he hears you. And he, and he, and he loves you. Don't do anything dumb. Phone a friend. We're here. Pastors are here. We're here to talk. To you. You're here in church. There's fellowship here. We, we are here. Get into a small group study. We love you. We're, this, we're in it together. He's praying for unity and harmony, okay? I dare you to try the unity and harmony out. Try the team out. The church, the body of believers. All right. Verse 16. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Okay, he's saying they're not of the world. They're not worldly or belonging to the world, just like I'm not. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Okay, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. I love when big words like sanctify or justify or glorify come in or joy. I love when these Bible words come in together because I don't know all the precise definitions. So I love learning about them and I love sharing with them because I can't imagine I'm the only one. So sanctify, it means to separate them. It's a process, sanctification. It's a process. It's a process. During our lives on this side of heaven, God is making us more like his son sanctification okay on this side of heaven he's making us more like his son that's sanctification put a pin in that we'll get right to it in just a second put a pin in that okay your word is truth right he says to separate us by your truth and jesus gets specific about what truth is it's god's word not well your truth is your truth 
My truth is my truth. Let's not offend each other. Baloney. God's word is truth. It's very clear. Don't argue with me. Argue with Jesus. He's the one who said it. God's word is truth. Absolute truth. Not some truth. It's the truth. And we have it. Well, you're being narrow. Jesus said it, not Pastor Rick. I'm just saying what the Son has given me the authority to say. God's word, and we have it. And it's free, and it's for everyone. God is separating me by his word, right? By his word, not just the latest inspirational talk you heard everyone in the office talk about that's on YouTube or some crazy TED talk that's out there. No, God's word is the truth. By his truth. Okay, remember, sanctification, the process of making our lives more like his son. Okay, take that. Okay, let's have it now. Let's take a look at it. We'll get our pin back. It's going to dovetail real nice into verse 18. The Greek word for sanctify is hagiazo. Hagiazo, which means to set apart for God's use. Set apart for God's use. This separation that I'm talking about, it's not isolation, but relation, right? It's a relationship with the Lord. We just read that Jesus didn't pray that we'd get removed, so you don't have to, like, get saved and go join the local monastery. No, we're supposed to be here in society and with the church. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. They are in this world, and for now we're here to stay to stay, to continue the mission, right? Jesus was sent on a mission to reveal God. Jesus sends his disciples on mission to what? Make more disciples of all nations, right, is what it says at the end of Matthew. We're being made more like Jesus, sanctified, separated, set apart for God's use. So what does that mean in light of what we just read? Okay, here it goes. We have a choice. We can fill a pew, or we can fill people's lives with hope and love and God's message. Does that mean I want you guys to run out of here and just start Bible-thumping everybody you see? No. Well, what it does mean is you can have a relationship with the Lord. You can rest in his love, which doesn't mean you just kick your feet up on the couch. It means if you yield to the Lord and allow him to work in your life, through your life, things like joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness, faithfulness, it's going to start producing out of your life. People around you are going to like see it. Organically, these conversations are going to come up about like what's changed? Why do you have all this hope and joy in 2020? Everybody's freaking out. And you're like, well, God's, you know, that is a little scary, but God's in control. Where do you get that from? Well, I went to church. Tell me about it. Stuff like that's going to happen. There are people that go out and, and, and knock on doors and share it. God's called them to do that. He's made it happen for them. God bless them. I'm just saying that it's okay that we yield in God's love and allow him to just work in and through our lives. He's not calling us to isolation. He's calling us to enjoy this relationship with him. He's not calling us to remove us from society and the world. No, he's saying, Lord, keep them there. I got a mission for them. Protect them. Man, that's what he wants for us. Okay. And if you're like, well, I don't have these opportunities to share, or I don't have it, pray. Ask God. God, I I learned this word sanctify tonight. What is it that you're setting me apart for? What am I going to be used for, Lord? Maybe it's sharing in kids' ministry. Maybe it's sharing and <clears throat> coming to Ben's prayer. Maybe it's getting involved with high school. Maybe it's welcoming people in, through the front doors on Sunday mornings or whatever. There, there's opportunities. Maybe it's being that prayer warrior in your office or in your neighborhood. Okay? There's opportunities everywhere. Ask the Lord to reveal it to you. When I got saved when I surrendered my life to the Lord and he did all his work on me for months and months and months I'd sit I'd sit in service and Pastor Jason or the other uh staff pastors uh back then it was it wasn't it was Pastor Jason and I can't remember the other guys but he'd come out and he'd go hey there's opportunities to plug in guys and he'd like always say that get plugged in I'd be like Lord where do you want me to plug in at help me Lord because there's some opportunity 
And then months go by, and an opportunity availed itself. In the, in the weirdest place I never thought would be possible. And it launched me into ministry. The God, I waited, but God finally opened up an opportunity, and he called me into ministry. Man, he has a plan for you and I that we should walk in it. Good works. He has that for us. For your sakes, he says, I sanctify myself, that they may be sanctified by your truth. Jesus has set himself apart for us, and now he sets us apart for him. Pray for these opportunities. Lord, how are you setting me apart today? Maybe you're still trying to figure out the first step. I don't have a relationship with the Lord. Well, pray. Talk to God. We've been watching his son talk to him. It's a simple conversation. If you've never given your heart to the Lord, if you've never asked Jesus into your life, don't leave here without doing it. We want to pray with you. Right? We'll pray for you and we want to pray with you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, so much has been covered tonight, Lord. We know that we know, we know that we know that you have a plan for us, Lord. We know that you want us here, Lord. We know that you've given us resources, Lord, when things are going wrong, like your word, your truth. You've given us a church, Lord, who will listen to us and pray for us, Lord. But Lord, more importantly, you've prayed for us. You've prayed for protection. You've wanted us to be set apart and made more like your son. Lord, I, I pray that as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, that Holy Spirit, you are just tugging on someone's heart, Lord, watching online or here in the service. And if that's you, then we want to pray with you. We pray this prayer as often as we can here at the packing house. We don't want to embarrass anybody, so we'll, we'll pray it with you out loud. It's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation for Jesus to come into our lives. And it's a simple prayer, and it goes like this, and we'll all pray out loud with you. It goes, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying, Amen. Well, guys, if no one's told you that they love you today, I love you, church. More importantly, God loves you. Merry Christmas. Next week, we'll be in uh, Matthew chapter 1, going through the Christmas story. God bless you guys. Good night.